treated the same. Uh, type 1, probably a large gene defect, uh, decreased functional, decreased total protein S, decreased free protein S. Type 2 would be the dysfunctional protein S where you've got abnormal functional level, uh, but normal total and normal free. And as we'll talk about, you have to watch out for this pattern. You can have some abnormalities that interfere with the functional assay, like high protein, uh, like high factor 8 or factor 5 Leiden can make it falsely look like you have low functional S, and we'll talk about that the next slide. Type 3 protein S deficiency where you have decreased functional and decreased free with normal total protein S. That's essentially the protein S going this direction, most of it bound to C4B binding protein. That can be due to a, a mutation that gives you increased binding to C4B binding protein or an acute phase response that actually increases your C4B binding protein level. If I see this pattern, I often look at the factor um, 8, the fibrinogen, the CRP. If I see that, then I'm saying this probably isn't really a type 3 protein S deficiency. It's probably just an acute phase response. So why does factor 8 and factor 5 Leiden screw up functional protein S assays? And, and depending on the ones that are available on the market, some are more uh, affected by this than others. But most assays for protein S functional assays take account of the fact that protein S as a cofactor to protein C degrade factor 5 and factor 8. And if you don't have factor 5 and factor 8, your clotting times, like your PTT, are going to be longer. So a shorter clot time in the assay is associated with a lower protein S. A longer clot time in the assay is associated with a higher protein S. So anything in these assays that makes your clot time longer will make it look like your protein S is higher. So actually high levels of heparin, direct thrombin inhibitors, lupus anticoagulants can mask a protein S deficiency and make it look like your protein S is high. So DTIs, heparin, lupus, anticoagulants here, anything that makes your clot time shorter, like high levels of factor VIII, like factor V Leiden, can actually make it look like your protein S is lower. So anytime I see an isolated low protein S, I look at factor VIII. And that's one of the reasons I have factor VIII in, in the hypercoag panel, because I find it useful for troubleshooting some of these other abnormalities since we're doing interpretation. So high factor VIII can explain a, lo a low protein S. So in this case, since it's an interference with the functional assay, what should the antigen be? Should be normal. So if you do antigenic protein S in these individuals, they should have normal protein S antigen. Same thing with factor V Leiden. So in general, for protein S deficiency, you can do initial testing by either the functional uh, protein S assay, or there are now some specific immunoassays for free protein S, and those are probably suitable as well. They're not subject to as many interferences as the functional protein S assay. I think if you're going to do the functional protein S assay in the lab, be prepared for being able to explain why that functional protein S level is low by backing up and saying doing factor eight or factor V Leiden, the free protein S assay is not associated with those problems. So the functional protein S assays can detect some types of protein S deficiency missed by these immunoassays, uh, but they're really subject to lots of different inter interferences. Sometimes I think they're more trouble than they're worth, but you should really use them for initial testing with caution if you're going to do the clot-based assays. So if the functional assay is abnormal, you want to confirm with a monoclonal uh, free protein S assay. So really, you don't have to do the total protein S. The only way that I think that that helps is trying to sort out some of those type 3 um, abnormalities. And again, they're not going to treat them any differently. Uh, lupus anticoagulant, um, if you've got one of those, probably doing the free protein S assay is the best, best way to go for initial testing because you're not going to have any interference uh, with, with the clotting assay. And as I mentioned, a lupus anticoagulant can mask a protein S deficiency. And you may want to consider some gender-specific ranges in the publication that we had in the archives um, from, from the consensus conference. The levels in females do change after menopause. They, they do, do go higher. Um, also, oral contraceptive and hormone replacement therapy uh, that can lower protein S levels. Also keep in mind that pr protein S goes down during pregnancy. Almost all women by their third trimester are going to have low protein S levels. So avoid calling a pregnant woman protein S deficient because she probably will bounce back up after delivery. So last case, 65-year-old female. 
uh, developing an iliofemoral DVT three days after a, a hip replacement. She has here a normal protime and PTT. Her fibrinogen was high at 500. Her factor VIII was high. Her C-reactive protein is high. Her protein C and protein S are normal, or her protein C and antithrombin are normal, and you can see where I'm going here. The protein S uh, being low in the setting of um, a high fibrinogen, and here she turns out to be a heterozygote factor V lighting. So she's got two reasons why her protein S clottable assay uh, may be lower than what, what you would expect. So you'd want to do uh, a total protein S and a free protein S in this uh, instance to show that these are actually both normal and that chances are that it's just due to both the high factor VIII and this heterozygote um, that are affecting her protein S assay. Now, the acute phase response may go away, but her factor V Leiden isn't going to go away, so the effect on the protein S assay uh, may not go away either. So the moral, a lot of things can affect these clottable protein S assays. You have to really use them in, with caution if you're interpreting that this person has a protein S deficiency, which is why I give interpretive reports uh, so that I can give clinicians some guidance that I think this is or is not really protein S deficiency. And in this case, an elevated factor VIII and factor V Leiden can falsely depress these clottable protein S levels. Yeah, are we, okay, because I just have... <coughs> We we're supposed to stop at 10? Yeah. Okay, yep, my last slides. Okay, let's, we've gone through the APC resistance. Just mention at the end here then, as far as uh, looking for factor V Leiden, I don't recommend starting with the molecular testing, um, is that we, we need to, should start with a functional assay. It's a, a less expensive assay, picks up factor V Leiden as well as some of the other factor V uh, mutations. And the second generation assays are typically um, the patients diluted with factor V depleted plasma to replace all of the other clotting factors. Uh, the reagents contain a heparin neutralizing agent and essentially you're looking at the clotting time uh, with added activated protein C versus the clotting time without activated protein C. And if this is normal, I would just stop and you don't need to do the expensive genotyping. Uh, if you are going to go then, if this is abnormal, you'd want to genotype for factor V Leiden. If this is negative, then you might have a false positive APC uh, ratio. And you can see that certainly with lupus anticoagulants and with direct thrombin inhibitors. So you want to make sure you look for those. Or very rarely, there may be another mutation. And in, in, in that case, sometimes we'll go to sequencing to look for some of the other, like Factor V Hong Kong uh, or Factor V Cambridge. And at the end, the prothrombin mutation, you just do the prothrombin genotyping. There really aren't any other screening assays. So this would be the panel that I would recommend, Protime PTT screening for lupus anticoagulants with a cardiolipin antibody, uh, functional assays for antithrombin, protein C and protein S, Factor V Leiden, I would start with the APC resistance assay, reflex to the, to the gene test if you, if you have an abnormal uh, prothrombin, just do the PCR. And you have to keep in mind that you know, if people have repeat panels, you don't have to repeat their genotypes because they're not going to change. Uh, we have a way in our computer system, if the doctor wants to order this again, uh, it'll come up and say this person's had a genotyping before, it's best practice not to do this again. Uh, homocysteine, I think, is still controversial. Uh, I like the factor VIII and the fibrinogen because it helps me sort out some of the abnormalities in the acute phase response. So with that, I will stop, and um, thank you for your attention.